Dan LaPelle for New Focus Recordings, and I'm joined by composer and colleague Douglas Boyce, uh, whose newest record of chamber music, The Hunt by Night, is coming out tomorrow, uh, March 5th. And is tomorrow March 5th? Is it tomorrow March 5th. March 5th. This year is flying by slash lasting decades. Yes. It's, uh, it's... It's glacial and meteoric somehow. Th just... Thanks for joining us, Douglas. And you're joining us from Boone, North Carolina, right? From Boone, North Carolina, uh, up on the Blue Ridge, um, right. uh, which is uh, an interesting place to spend a pandemic. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, and isolation, this... the isolation part is very simple. <laughs> nice. Yeah, well, that, that, that's helpful. And this is your second release with New Focus, the first being Some Consequences of incapa Incapacities. Uh, and, well, I don't know, let's, uh, I think before we forget, because I often do this, let's shout out some key people uh, who had a big hand in this, uh, besides for yourself. Uh, well, you know, I think we'll, we'll uh, talk about uh, pretty much all of the players as we go through. Sure. But of course, there's these wonderful performers from uh, Count Induction, um, pianist Diego Yoko Bobuchute, who is uh, just wonderful, fabulous young cellist named Skylar Slack, uh, uh, people from the um, Trio Capitina, really a, w a wonderful collection of players and players that I, that I really have loved work with and in, in Many cases have worked with for a very long time, um, and uh, I think that's something that I, I, we can come back to when we talk about the record as a whole. It's a very special record to me because of those people, yeah. And in the same way, uh, mostly recorded at Octave and uh, Audio uh, with Ryan Struber, yeah. Um, which is just a way, I describe it to many people as uh, my uh, my favorite place on the planet. Yeah, and you know, and. Uh... Ryan knows your music so well, so well that you know it, it really shows in the care that that. Uh... Yeah. So well, let's let's dive in and talk about uh, three of these pieces that are on on the record. Maybe let's start with Quintet La Marme, uh, and th this is sort of brings up a question that I feel like is a, a fairly common thread throughout a lot of your work, which is an engagement with older music and with older themes. And I'm I'm curious. You know, I have some idea from listening to the piece, but I, I, I'd love to hear from you uh, the ways in which you grapple with older thematic material. What's the process there? Well, uh, uh, Quintin Lamarmet is actually one where I think the, um, the process of composition actually sort of renders invisible or inaudible a lot of the, 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 the origin points. In some of my other music, it's very, it's very much on the surface. Um, uh, there's a couple of, of uh, duo pieces um, that have, uh, they in many ways, a sort of reworking of our, of our subtilior uh, uh, music. And in Quintet La Marmite, which is one of the first ones, uh, it's it's the first piece well, that I can think of that uh, that sort of has something in the title that sort of marks its historicality, that um, that sort of frames then frames the entire uh, 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 the the entire experience of listening to it, sort of in you know your historical ears pricked up. Um, and it's one in which, you know, the, the, this theme, uh, uh, which was the basis of so many masses uh, for so many, <laughs> for multiple centuries, um, it, it, it was absolutely the origin point. Uh, but at the same time, by the time I had thought about the material and worked the material, um, it, uh, it's, it's difficult to pick out. Uh, while at the same time, uh, it's in some ways one of the, my more stricter appropriations of historical practices. Lots of passage, lots, many parts of the piece are pretty strict isorhythmic structures. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. um, and at that, at the moment that I wrote it, um, I was, I think I was, this one of, I would think of sort of, the, in addition to being one of the first real sort of counter-induction pieces, right? one of these pieces that were written for the group for the instrumentation of what was then the, our, our basic instrumentation. Um, but it's also a point of me coming, sort of coming to the end of my, ends of my study and saying, okay, what, what is this, what is this voice, what is this sound that I'm after? And even though in some ways I feel like I could have lost the La Marme part of the title, uh, for me that, that those studies, those years of study, um, uh, were sort of pervade in the piece. They, they're there in the, 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 I was always asking the question of how, what is the next thing to do the, to this thematic material? How does it knit together? But at the same time seeing that sometimes that those gaps in technical processes um, historically are so vast that some, sometimes it kind of can't be overcome or the process of translation kind of loses it. Now I do think there are moments in the piece where the character has a sort of, uh, a sort of ancient character uh, to it, but if you start running around for the, for the pitches, it can be very, it's, it is craftily hidden away. And wow. I do remember though bumping into a, uh, at, was at some, I was given a guest lecture or something and, and, a, and an old teacher of mine was in the, a medievalist was in the, was in the room and someone sort of challenged me on that. I was like, well, my, but I can't really, I can't, I know the Lama, we all know the Lama Maitun in that room. Everybody knew the Lama Maitun and they said, but you know, I can't really hear it. It doesn't make any sense. And Jenny Bloxham sort of then sort of stood up in defense and gave this list litany of all of these uh, medieval and Renaissance pieces where the, uh, the origin point is is effaced by the process itself of composing. Yeah. And so while it, this piece did make me think a lot about historicality, it also made me, uh, I think it was the start of a much more mature thinking of what is the process by which one goes about claiming to be composing, claim, you know, to be the claimant to some kind of creativity. Yeah. Um, and, uh, well, I, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily assume that if if there's a famous theme in a title that it's going to be sort of immediately discernible. I think just just the idea that it was a jumping off point um, yeah you know is is sort of enough. I mean you might find yourself listening for it for sure, but yeah I I feel like I've encountered so many pieces where it references either the you know fully a theme or or Lamar yeah. or whatever and then you listen you're like okay uh this isn't necessarily meant to be like a Where's Waldo type of music. Right, right, right. Uh, yes. should, we, should we listen to a little bit I of I think we should jump into it. It's a, nice little, it's a nice little moment that captures some of the sort of intensity of the opening, which is yeah. really uh, And so this is something... performed by Counter Induction, which of course is the group you co-founded. And uh, it's Caleb Vanderswag on cello, Ben Finglin on clarinet, Miranda Cookson on violin, Jessica Meyer on viola, and Ning Yu on piano, correct? Yep.
Beautiful. So uh, should we tie that into the, the record as a whole and sort of move on to another piece to, to discuss? Yeah, I, I think that um, the, the quintet is, uh, you know, it exhibits a, a lot of features of, of my music. There's a fair amount of aleatory. Uh, there are, uh, there's, a, I think, a tension between pretty severe, uh, intense passages uh, and then, uh, you know, restful, almost meditative regions, um, and it's and so it, it it sort of exhibits a lot of those uh, a bunch of different features in my music, but I think the big thing uh, and the one that is a reason uh, we decided to put it on first uh, uh, on the album. Um, uh, it's, I think, uh, uh, a great example of you know, why I love writing chamber music, why I love listening to chamber music, why I love thinking about chamber music, uh, really kind of beyond any other, beyond any other music that I've, that I've participated in, that I've, that I've listened to. And there's a, um, a strangely public intimacy to the performance of this kind of music. Uh, you're there in the trenches with these people trying to put this thing together and watching it unfold and, and then collapse and then uh, emerge again and, and, and collapse in different ways. And in, uh, in La Marme, uh, and then again in the second piece we're, that we're going to listen to, which is a, um, uh, a, from a set of etudes that I'm, that I'm continuing to work on, this one for cello and piano, uh, sort of the aleatoric passages, the sort of Ludwigskian um, designed chance uh, passages, um, are there in no small part to sort of perturb the easy regimented interaction of performers that can happen in notated music. Um, and I, I, I when I, whenever I'm sort of you know being my professor self and talking about this, uh, I talk about how I, I'm really interested in aleatory, not because of aleatory. I'm interested like I'm interested in open pulse, because there then can be a moment where the pulse reasserts itself, the shared pulse reasserts itself, and meter comes into existence. But then at any moment for the dialogue, it can fall apart again, mm -hmm. uh, and that's very much present in Quintet Le Mermaid. It's very much the operative feature in, um, in, the, in the stretto. In some ways, the stretto of the title, Stretto Perpetual, is, is that tension of we're compressing, we're expanding, we're but we're also just sort of shifting in and out of connection, not to some extent in phase, but more sort of like, how is this agreement, how do we come again to an agreement about where the beat is, where the bar is, where these things. Yeah. And so it's, it's for me, uh, the wonderful thing about chamber music, what I always try to bring out in, in my music is that perpetual challenge of how can human beings connect when they're doing these things, especially when like this piece and a lot of Lamar Ray, it's really quite challenging. It's really quite challenging technically. In some ways, it's there to be challenging technically so that it places even more pressure on this question of togetherness, of sort mm -hmm. of unity. Yeah, it's uh, true. When, when something is de that demanding, there's no choice but to engage fully, you know? Yeah, exactly. You, you, you don't stand a chance if, if you're sort of, uh, as a performer, going at it you know, with any halfway or anything, you know? Yeah. Um, well, should we, you want to take a listen to an excerpt of this uh, to sort of put some sounds to words? I think that's, I think that's a great idea. Why don't you introduce this one in terms of performance? Uh, so this is uh, Stretto Perpetuo. It's uh, from the uh, fourth choir of the uh, Book of Etudes project, like I was saying. And some of them are solo pieces, and some of them are trio pieces, some of them are duo pieces, all combinations of piano, clarinet, and uh, cello, and so this is from the subset of piano and cello, 
etudes that, that are in there. It's uh, performed by uh, pianist Diego Yokobogucute, who's a uh, who actually is just has just started this year at, uh, on the faculty at Duke. Um, wonderful uh, pianist from Lithuania, who I've known. Oh, good lord, that's depressing. Who I've known twenty years, um, and uh, Skylar Slack, who's now um, with the Richmond Symphony. Wonderful cellist, uh, who I have not known for nearly that long four years, five years, something like that, uh, yeah. but a wonderful player and a, and a wonderful soul. Uh, Great. And, and so this sort of actually was one of the things that brought them together to play together. So there's a, again, outside of the piece, there is this sort of chamber music as this great coming together of individuals into, into collections. Beautiful. Let's take a listen. Beautiful. Do you want to give a little bit of context for this painting on the cover and uh, and immediately behind you? Yeah, immediately behind, <laughs> behind me, of course, and um, sort of some of the conceptual background of the of the album as a whole. Well, um, speedy stuff in there that's of interest, I think. Yeah, and I, I think that the 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 painting, um, which is some sometimes called uh, The Hunt by Night, sometimes called uh, The Hunt in the Forest, um, is a 15th century um, painting by uh, Paolo Uccello. Um, and it, it struck me for a couple of reasons, which, which we'll, we'll talk about. I'll, I'll present in some ways both what it does, which made me feel like both naming a piece after it and then after I had named the piece, after naming a whole record after it, um, uh, it is, uh, and you can see it elsewhere, you can see bits of it behind Dan right now. Uh, it is quite literally an image of a hunt being undertaken. Uh, and it, in the full visual, it's this extremely uh, wide painting and uh, like on the booklet in the CD, it, it sort of wraps around the entire thing. And that's still only maybe 70% of the painting. It's, it's there's a tremendous visual life to it. And it's this wonderful mixture of uh, energy and motion and violence and violence about to happen uh, as these horses and these dogs and these running men are going into this forest in, in search of a uh, stag, in search of deer. And you see a few of them within, but it's at the same time, it feels very ordered. And the trees of the forest are sort of this grid uh, that you're perceiving. It's also, you know, in the relatively uh, early days of, of the sort of down, not the earliest days, but you know, of, uh, of perspective uh, in the visual arts, and so there's in some ways there's this tremendous depth of view as uh, as you track the trees into the forest and you see the figures getting smaller within the forest, but at the same time much of it is some of it seems very quite flat, like a much older um, older uh, visual styles um, for these. And so um, I had written a piece that was very much about a, 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 
it felt like a caccia. It was a chase. It was a sort of uh, uh, players pursuing one another. And that's actually the last piece on this on this CD. Um, and so I, I first came to it because of that, because of that. And uh, but it also struck me as not just of that particular chase of that piece, but something of the narrative of, the, of everything I just said about chamber music. There's this there's this strange pursuit which is highly ordered, but also fragmented, and also could come apart at the seams at any moment. And so there's a visual energy to it. And then a, 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 this was quite literally by chance. Um, uh, I've been looking through the, uh, it's in the Bodleian, the paintings in the Bodleian Library in Oxford. And I was sort of like, oh, they have lots of paintings. Maybe they have something. I'm sort of thinking about things. And then I searched a little bit more uh, about the piece. And it had also been uh, discussed in a, in a poem uh, by Derek Mahone, uh, in, uh, incredible Irish poet uh, who had just just passed in October, um, and in his uh, in his I call it in the program it's an ephrasis sort of because it's not just talking about the poem but it's talking about other things through talking about the poem. He talks about how it also has this childlike character, this playfulness uh, to it. Um, which was quite striking because I had previously written a piece referencing, I wouldn't necessarily say based on, a different poem by Derek Mahone, which was very much interested in, in uh, childhood and relationships of, of uh, fathers to offspring. Um, and so at that point, I was like, okay, apparently this is supposed to be the name of this piece because it connects to this other piece I wrote and that just sort of came upon it in a wonderful way. Um, and uh, then as I thought about it, I was like, well, that's if, if I'm gonna make any great claims about this being a, a disc of chamber music, that's the painting for it. Uh, but the, this is maybe not the most elegant, but a transition maybe thinking about a third piece we might look at today, which is, uh, Sails a uh, knife bright in a seasonal wind, uh, which is a piece that um, I had sketched out. I had done some of it. It sort of grew into the name, and the piece grew and changed quite a bit over time. And another thing that happened in that uh, in that time span between my first sketches of the piece. And the piece finishing was I had a child. I had a, I, uh, had a little boy. And um, it's a poem. It's from Akil. Uh, I won't read the whole thing. It's it's quite long, but I but it's a I will just say that it's a, it is a poem about uh, being a parent and being sort of near your family, but then also being uh, away from your family to some extent by because of the nature of what you do uh, and uh, maybe I'll just read the first stanza uh, the Akil by Derek Mahone uh, I'll skip over the Irish because I'll just d destroy the pronunciation um, I lie and imagine a first light gleam in the bay after one more night of erosion and nearer the grave then stand and gaze from the window at break of day as a sheer water skims the ridge of an incoming wave. And I think of my son, a dolphin in the Aegean, a sprite among sails knife bright in a seasonal wind, and wish he were here where Corrects walk on the ocean to ease with his talk the solitude locked in my mind. And the whole poem continues in other themes, but it, it um, made me think a lot about this, this strange, one of the strange things about being a composer of chamber music and not a performer of chamber music, or at least not a performer that uh, anyone should be, uh, uh, should, <laughs> no one should pay me uh, to play anything. Um, uh, there's a loneliness, uh, there's an isolation, there's a, a, a stepping back and to some extent in, in the day-to-day -day life. There's a sort of stepping back because 
you're working and thinking about this thing that will happen and will be collective, but at the moment of writing is, is alone, is, is, is solo. And uh, so just this poet sort of writing about his children uh, made me think about my, my little boy and uh, uh, as I put in the program notes, uh, uh, he, has a, he has a guitar that he, uh, I'm sorry, Danny, he's not yet really begun to study properly, but he loves making noise with. Uh, but more than anything, he just, he loves to dance. He's always in movement and energy and, and, and flow. Um, and so I think that the piece in a, in a, you know, in a, in a four-year-old kind of way, um, you know, has these turns of like a lot of energy and then an almost, you know, manic obsession with some little thing. And then it just turns and does something else. And then sometimes just relaxes for a long period of time. Uh, and that's something like what it is to be, you know, I'm sitting, uh, like I'm sitting right here at my desk. And now, especially with the isolation, I sort of look out in, over there into the other room where he's, now he's old enough that he's doing his homework and he's doing his reading. And he's doing, uh, but it's funny because it's tremendously close. And yet there's this, there's this gap, there's this, there's this distance, uh, which again, to, to pick up on the, on the great thing, I think that's one of the things that is so beautiful about just the notion of chamber music, that with the right people and the right people present and listening and engage with, uh, something quite distinct happens in that connection that mm -hmm. I find very different from many other, I don't think all, but many other modes of, of music making, uh, where somehow this distance and this incredibly elaborate music that's happening and often on the sacred elevated stage, you know, uh, somehow there's something about that process that's going on there that is connective. It's connected from the players to the players and it's connected from the audience to the, um, to the Great. Well, let's, let's take a listen to, to some of uh, this piece, Sales Knife, right in a seasonal wind. Um, I, will, I should say, so this features uh, Jeff Irving, a uh, fabulous percussionist, mm -hmm. um, uh, Miranda Cookson, um, the extraordinary Miranda Cookson, I'm not mm -hmm. sure what else to say about Miranda, and some guitar player. I right. can't. I can't quite remember uh, who is. Uh, this is a, this is sort of a trailer from a um, a full sort of cinematic uh, uh, performance of it. Uh, so it's a little bit out of order, but it gives something I think of the sense of that coming together and that working on things together. Yeah, great. Okay, here it is. Great. Well, it's really fun to revisit uh, that piece, but also that session, which was a really enjoyable session. And uh, cool. This was a really nice, you know, little taste uh, of 
some of the music on the album and and some great background uh, for for people who are interested. And I'd just say, you know, check out the the album. It's a really uh, wonderful collection of pieces. Uh, Hunt by Night, Douglas Boyce. It's on our website and all the other places you can find music. And uh, it comes out tomorrow, March fifth. March fifth or March four? I, I I keep on time. <laughs> nothing to me right it's, now. It's the fifth. Don't worry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So today, that's the that's the, that's that's the, the historicity fourth. thing. That's it, right. You know, just all, the day that it's Trump all, was to get, all centuries at the same time. Right? So. Trump was supposed to get re-inaugurated today. So <laughs> I don't know if it happened. I didn't check the news. Uh, anyway, thank you everybody for joining us, and thanks so much, Douglas, for taking the time to talk about this record. And uh, and and thank you, Dan, for uh, oh, running that running that uh, little label that you weren't run because it's a. Uh, it's a, a wonderful service to the community. Well, in the, it's in our the best pleasure. possible way. Okay, everybody, we'll sign off and uh, see you 